All right, Hunger Games fans, buckle up since the Hunger Games' The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes has knocked at our doors. It's the perfect time for a refresher on the epic saga of Pan Am, its heroes and villains. Let's dive into the intricate world Suzanne Collins has created, spanning from the origins of the Hunger Games to the iconic rebellion led by Katniss Everdeen. The Hunger Games, released in 2012, plunged us into the dystopian world of Pan Am, a nation of 12 districts under the iron grip of the capital. It's a place where the rich gets rich and the poor are pawns in a brutal game of survival. One could say Hunger Games was like the 1984 meets Lord of the Flies with a dash of Gladiator thrown in. In this video, we will explore the entire Hunger Games franchise including The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the latest addition to the saga. While it deals with the origin story of Coriolanus Snow, the notorious president of Pan Am, it also throws light upon the evolution of the Hunger Games. This is going to be a super descriptive and spoiler-heavy video, so if you're still here, let's explore this thrilling and marvelous saga. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you and let's begin. The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes Set during the early days of Pan Am's turbulent history, we witnessed the origins of The Hunger Games, a brutal spectacle in its infancy. The story kicks off with a jolt from the past, the death of General Crasis Snow during the First Rebellion. He was the patriarch of the Snow family. Fast forward a decade and we meet his son Coriolanus, an 18-year-old with ambitions to revive his family's faded glory. As the tenth Hunger Games knocks at the door, Coriolanus is chosen as one of the 24 mentors. As you may know, each mentor including Coriolanus is paired with a tribute. Coriolanus gets Lucy Greybeard from District 12, a girl who instantly captivates the capital with her singing and a stunt she pulls off on the mayor's daughter. The mentors are advised by games author Casca Highbottom to focus on entertainment over victory, a shift in strategy that Coriolanus doesn't mind. The declining viewership of the Lube Large as a sword that threatened the continuation of the games, and that's why this new strategy was being adopted. So what was Coriolanus's game plan. Well, make Lucy Gray the capital's darling. The stakes are high, the most captivating Tributes mentor gets a ticket to prosperity. But the Tributes would not simply trust their mentors, right? I mean, these are men and women who had been picked up against their will and thrown into a pit to die. So, Tigris, the sister of Coriolanus, suggests that he builds a rapport with Lucy Gray. Coriolanus goes to receive the girl at the train station, but she is soon taken away, so he follows her and hitches the ride in which the Tributes were being taken. You see, all other Tributes Tribute saw Coriolanus as an outsider, someone who represented their oppressors, so they tried to attack him, but Lucy managed to stop the attackers long enough until they were all thrown into a cage in the capital zoo. So the Tributes were basically considered no better than animals. As of now, Coriolanus is not the bad guy we know him to be. He genuinely cares about Lucy and the other Tributes, but especially Lucy. He also works to humanize Lucy Gray in the eyes of the public, earning their sympathy. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes amps up the tension with Coriolanus in the snow, introducing a game-changing idea, a sponsorship scheme. This brainwave allows capital denizens to fund their favorite tributes. Snow's bond with his tribute Lucy Gray deepens, which sets a complex dynamic against the brutal backdrop of the games. He brings her food and suggests others do the same, but Arachne, another mentor, meets a grisly end at the hands of her own tribute. In the tribute's defense, Arachne was taunting her starving tribute with food. Anyway, this incident underscored the unpredictability and danger lurking in every corner of the games. The plot thickens during an arena tour where a rebel bomb disrupts the already chaotic environment, taking out mentors and tributes alike. Coriolanus would have died, but Lucy Gray's quick thinking saves him from a collapsing structure, shifting his view of her from a mere player in his game to someone more significant, someone who saved his life. He even entrusts her with rat poison, which was basically him cheating. As the Hunger Games commences, the initial frenzy results in a high casualty rate, among the tributes. Voluminous Gaul, the head game maker, integrates Coriolanus' sponsorship idea, spiking the game's popularity. Lucy Gray, ever the survivor, exploits a breach caused by the bombing to find refuge. But there's more than just survival at play. Coriolanus' super-rich friend, Sejanus Plinth, had his childhood friend as his tribute, who was later killed by another tribute. So, Sejanus enters the arena and mourns for his fallen friend. Sejanus needed to be brought back, so Coriolanus himself was forced into the arena, 
resulting in a life or death confrontation where he kills a tribute. The killings and more unfortunate deaths continue to happen and Lucy struggles but succeeds in staying alive. In the third act of the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the stakes are raised and the drama intensifies. Coriolanus Snow, ever the schemer, finds a way to give Lucy Gray an edge in the arena. He drops a handkerchief scented with her fragrance into a tank of genetically modified snakes. You see, the snakes did not attack anyone whose scent they were accustomed to, but why did Voluminus plan to meddle with the result of the games? Well, the president's son had been killed in the rebel bombings and she did not want any of the tributes alive, but Coriolanus' move pays off. The snakes spare Lucy Gray, making her the last tribute standing. Despite head game maker Gaul's reluctance, capital viewership pressure seals Lucy Gray's victory, but Snow's victory is short-lived. He's caught because of the incriminating pieces of evidence, the handkerchief and poison, which leads to a severe punishment. A 20-year stint as a peacekeeper, he's get a ticket to District 12, where Lucy is from. District 12 brings new challenges and subplots. Coriolanus begins peacekeeper training alongside Sejanus Plinth, also punished for his arena intrusion. Snow's reunion with Lucy Gray at District 12 Hob, where she sings, rekindles their complex relationship. Meanwhile, Sejanus' covert dealings with rebels throw him and Coriolanus on opposite ends. Coriolanus, playing the spy, records Sejanus' righteous but treasonous plans and sends them to Gaul. But the drama doesn't stop there. A violent altercation at a pub called the Hob leads to a murder spree in which the mayor's daughter and her boyfriend, who was also Lucy's ex, are killed. Of course, we see Sejanus pay the ultimate price for his rebellion, while Lucy Gray offers Coriolanus Coriolanus' chance to flee to the north with her. Coriolanus Snow's journey to the north with Lucy Gray Baird, filled with tension and uncertainty, reaches a boiling point. Discovering the hidden weapons and realizing Lucy Gray's awareness of his betrayal, Snow's paranoia escalates. The chase that ensues ends with Coriolanus getting bitten by a snake bite an event that Lucy had orchestrated, but it also serves as a stark metaphor for Snow's own treacherous nature. Snow tries to shoot her down, but she manages to escape. In a twist of bitter irony, Snow is offered a university spot funded by the oblivious parents of Sejanus, the very person he betrayed. They thought that they were helping their late son's friend, but the truth was far sinister. In the end, we learn from High Bottom that the games were never meant to be more than a macabre academic concept twisted into reality by Snow's father. Snow poisons High Bottom, mirroring the ruthlessness he showed in the games. This fourth murder solidifies his transformation from a young man seeking to restore his family's honor to a cold and calculating figure, setting the stage for his future as a tyrant. The film attempts to capture the essence of Suzanne Collins's 2020 novel, but with varying degrees of success. Rachel Zegler's portrayal of Lucy Gray is a stark contrast to Jennifer Lawrence's Katniss, embodying a character that's more confection than conviction. The chemistry between Lucy Gray and Snow feels unconvincing, a sentiment that the script by Michael Leslie and Michael Arndt doesn't seem eager to correct. Tom Blight's Coriolanus Snow is a fascinating character study, reminiscent of a dystopian Scarlet O'Hara. His desperation to hide his impoverished background beneath a facade of aristocracy adds depth to his character, although some of his struggles feel underexplored. The film depiction of the Hunger Games themselves feels like a budget version of the original, a nod to their prototype status in the story's timeline. Where the film shines is in its third act, which is both engaging and thought-provoking. It tackles the complex themes of Collins' novels, although the adaptation struggles with balancing the brutality of the games with a PG-13 rating and fully conveying the story's political intricacies. Peter Dinklage portraying the vindictive creator of the game serves as a Rasputin-like character and is one of the few good things about to film. The Hunger Games 2012 The star of the show is Katniss Everdeen, a 16-year-old from District 12, portrayed by Jennifer Lawrence in a role that skyrocketed her career. She's tough, she's resourceful, and she's about to become the face of a revolution. At first, she volunteers for the 74th Hunger Games to save her sister Primrose, diving headfirst into a fight to the death on live TV. Accompanying Katniss is Peta Millar, the baker's son with a heart of gold and a crush on Katniss that's more than just for the cameras. Their dynamic 
is a mix of tension, alliance, and unspoken feelings, something that adds a human touch to the otherwise grim scenario. They're mentored by Hamish Abernathy, played by Woody Harrelson, who brings a much-needed dose of cynicism and humor to the mix. Then there are the careers, tributes from the wealthier districts who trained their whole lives for this moment. It's a stark reminder of the inequality in Pan Am, where some prepare for glory while others fight simply to survive. The games themselves are a spectacle of survival, strategy, and unexpected alliances. Katniss's alliance with Rue, the young tribute from District 11, becomes an interesting aspect. After Katniss and Rue team up, a partnership reminding us of unlikely friendships under dire circumstances, they pull off a daring move. Katniss blows up the career supplies using mines. It's a move that screams David and Goliath. But this movie isn't just about the triumphs of brains over bronze, it's about heartbreak too. Rue's death caused by Marvel's spear was pretty disturbing. Katniss's response killing Marvel and then singing to the dying Rue is both tender and tragic. The flower-adored farewell she gives Rue is not just a goodbye, it's a statement, a rebellion in its own right, sparking a riot in District 11. This moment is a turning point in a story where personal loss fuels a larger resistance. President Snow, with his icy demeanor that could give Hans Gruber from Die Hard a run for his money, realizes the gravity of the situation. He warns Crane about the brewing unrest, a sign that the games are having unintended consequences. In a twist, Hamish convinces Crane to allow two winners from the same district, hoping to quill the growing dissent. Then comes the reunion of Katniss and a severely injured Peter. It's a race against time and death as Katniss braves danger to get medicine for him. Her encounter with Clove is a nail-biter. However, Thresh surprisingly spares Katniss out of respect for Rue, the games continue with more twists. Like Peter's accidental brush with deadly nightlock berries and Fox faces death. As we reach the climax of the movie, we get to meet some aesthetically brilliant yet horrifyingly genetically modified beasts unleashed by the game maker, Seneca Crane. It's the final showdown with Katniss, Peter, and the ruthless Kato, the last standing tributes, forced onto the cornucopia's roof. In a desperate move, Kato uses Peter as a human shield, but Peter, ever the strategist, signals Katniss to shoot Kato's hand. It's a risky but brilliant play leading to Kato's fall and eventual merciful death by Katniss's arrow. Just when you think it's over, Crane pulls a fast one revoking the rule change that allowed two victors. It's a twist worthy of the best plot-driven dramas, pushing Katniss and Peeta into a quarter. They opt for a joint suicide with Nightlock Berries, but the capital isn't ready for such a dramatic ending. Crane, in a panic, declares them co-victors. It's a victory, but at what cost? The aftermath is just as intense. Hamish warns Katniss of the consequences of her defiance. The Capital is not known for forgiveness, Crane learns this the hard way, a poetic justice served with nightlock berries. In her final interview with Cesar, Katniss plays her part, spinning her actions as those of a love-struck girl rather than a rebellious symbol. President Snow crowns them as victors, but it is a victory overshadowed by the looming threat of the capital's wrath. As Snow contemplates their faith, turning his back and leaving the game control center, we're left wondering what's next for our heroes. The Hunger Games is more than just a story of survival, it's a tale of resistance, love, and the consequences of defiance. It's a narrative that resonates with anyone who's ever questioned authority or fought against the odds. This film isn't just a dystopian adventure, it's a reflection of our own world struggles with power, control, and the spirit of rebellion. Director Gary Ross captures the chaos and the cunning required to stay alive. The cornucopia bloodbath, where half the tributes are wiped out in the first few minutes, is as intense as it gets. It's a movie that makes you think, what would I do in their shoes? And that's the mark of a great film. It stays with you, challenges you, and maybe even changes the way you see the world. The Hunger Games Catching Fire 2013 Catching Fire starts with Katniss Everdeen still shaken from her Hunger Games experience, almost shooting her buddy Gale while hunting. PTSD's real, folks. She and Peter Millark as victors have to tour the districts, a grim reminder tour of sorts. President Snow drops by Katniss's swanky new place, warning her about inspiring rebellions. He's got an ultimatum. Convince everyone your love for Peter isn't a sham, or else your loved ones are in trouble. Katniss and Peter are 
are actually frosty with each other except when the cameras roll. But on tour, Peter suggests, hey, let's be friends. Anyway, their first stop is District 11, home of Katniss's late pal Rue. Peter, breaking protocol, offers financial help to families there. Katniss shares heartfelt words about Rue and Thresh. Their mentor, Hamish, tells them this lovey-dovey act must be their life now. The tour turns sour with another man punished for showing support and a young girl naively wanting to join the games. To calm the brewing storm, Katniss pitches a public engagement with Peter. It's a hit on TV, but Snow's not buying it. At his party, he gives Katniss the I'm not impressed look. Meanwhile, Katniss bumps into Plutarch Heavensby, the new head game maker, replacing the late Seneca Crane. They share a dance and some loaded chit chat. Later, we see President Snow and Plutarch Heavensby, the new head game maker, watching footage of rebels in District 8, waving banners with Katniss's mocking J symbol. Snow wants Katniss out of the picture, thinking she's a rebel icon, but Plutarch suggests a different plan. Use her as a pawn to show that even victors are under the capital's thumb. It's a bit of a gamble, but they're rolling the dice. Back in District 12, Katniss spills the beans about Snow's threats to Gale, but Gale's not thrilled about her engagement to Peeta and more into starting a revolution, especially after seeing District 8's uprising. Tensions skyrocketed in District 12 when a new squad of peacekeepers arrived. Gale gets whipped for defending an old vendor and Katniss nearly gets shot, trying to help him. Only Hamish and Peeta's quick thinking saves the day, reminding everyone how bad it would look if Katniss, the capital's darling, got killed. Despite a new curfew and threats from the peacekeepers, Katniss decides to stay and stir up trouble with a little moral support from her sister Prim. Snow's losing patience, wanting Katniss gone for good, but Plutarch insists on the right circumstances for her demise. Cue the third quarter quill, the Hunger Games 75th anniversary twist. The shocker this time is that the tributes are picked from past victors. Katniss being District 12's only female victor is automatically back in the arena. She's scared but strikes a deal with Hamish. If Peter's in the games, they'll make him the victor. At the reaping, Effie Trinket draws Katniss and Hamish, but Peter jumps in, volunteering to take Hamish's place. No tearful goodbyes this time, they're whisked straight to the train, heading for another round in the games. With Katniss and Peter back for the quarter quill, Hamish advises them to make friends because these games are a who's who of past victors. Katniss isn't keen on the career tributes or the unpredictable Johanna Mason and the capital darling Finnick O'Dare. She vibes with District 3's Wyrus and Beatty, and Mags from District 4. Despite her reluctance, everyone's eyeing Katniss as a top ally thanks to her archery prowess. The pre-game show kicks off with Caesar Flickerman. The tributes are seeding, wanting Snow to cancel the games. Katniss shows up in a wedding dress that transforms into a Mockingjay outfit. Talk about a fashion statement. Snow, not amused. Peta drops a bombshell that they're married and expecting. The crowd goes wild. The tributes link hands. Even Effie, capital through and through, shows she's got a heart, wishing Katniss and Peta better luck. But the drama's never far in the capital. Right before the game time, Cena gets beaten up by the peacekeepers right in front of Katniss. She's then thrown into a jungle arena with a salty twist. It's surrounded by a massive lake, split into wedges. There is a battle royale at the cornucopia, and Katniss teams up with Finnick thanks to a hint from Hamish and Mags. Meanwhile, the careers are sticking together as usual. Meanwhile, Snow's watching, itching for Katniss's downfall. Plutarch's like, chill, let's make her look bad first, and of course, Snow's game is as long as she ends up six feet under. In the arena, Katniss spots a force field, but too late for Peta, who gets hit. Finnick, though, plays the hero and revives him, then comes a nasty poisonous fog. Mags goes out like a champ, sacrificing herself for the team. They escape, but only to face killer mutt mandrills. A morphling from District 6 saves Peta, another selfless act in the brutal game. At the capital, the quarter quell is turning into a real mindbender. The tributes figure out the arena's a giant clock of horrors. Each hour, a different section dishes out a new nightmare. Meanwhile, Katniss's crew, Wyrus, Beatty, Johanna, and Finnick face off against the career tributes. Wyrus gets killed, but Katniss and Johanna fight back, taking down a couple of careers. Twists keep coming, Plutarch, the game maker, throws in a dizzying spin on the cornucopia, nearly drowning Katniss. He's really pulling the strings. Then there's the jabber, Jace, mimicking their loved one's screams. Katniss and Peeta ponder ditching their alliance, knowing it'll come down to a fight with their friends. They plan to split after midnight. Meanwhile, President Snow is getting his kicks watching this drama unfold, thinking Katniss might just sacrifice herself. Beatty cooks up a plan to electrocute the remaining 
dominating careers using the arena's lightning tree and the salt water. Katniss and Johanna started laying wires, but then Johanna knocks Katniss out, whispering something about careers on their tail. Katniss wakes up alone, Beatty is knocked out, and Pete is missing. She hears a cannon signaling a tribute's death and panics. Phoenix shows up, but Katniss almost shoots him until he reminds her, remember who the real enemy is. Light bulb moment, Katniss fires an arrow tied to the wire into the dome just as lightning strikes, blowing the arena's force field to bits. This knocks out Katniss and cuts the game's live feed. When Katniss wakes up, she's in a hovercraft with Beatty and, surprise, Haymitch, Finnick, and Plutarch, who's actually a rebel. They've been plotting to rescue her from the rebel cause. Destination? District 13. The twist, Peta and Johanna got snatched by the capital. Katniss flips out on Haymitch for not saving Peta. She's sedated, and when she comes to, Gail's there to drop another bomb. District 12's been raised by the capital. The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 1 dives right into the aftermath of the 75th Hunger Games. Katniss, Everdeen, along with Beatty and Finnick, find themselves in District 13, a rebel stronghold hiding beneath the ruins of the old District 13. There, she's reunited with her family and meets President Alma Coyne, the rebel leader. Katniss learns her arena antiques ignited uprisings against the capital. Coyne wants her as the Mockingjay. The rebellion's face, but Katniss is not on board, especially peeved about Peta being left behind. A trip to the obliterated District 12 and seeing Peta being used as the capital's mouthpiece changes her mind. She agrees to be the Mockingjay, but only if Peta and the other captives gets rescued and pardoned. We meet Haymitch, who points out that Katniss shines when she's unscripted. With a film crew led by Cressida, a capital defector, Effie Trinket as her stylist, and Gail as her bodyguard, Katniss heads to District 8. They visit a hospital, which then gets bombed by the capital, killing everyone inside. Fueled by anger, Katniss delivers a fury speech that gets broadcasted across Pan Am, thanks to Beatty's tech wizardry. Back in District 12, Gale recounts its destruction, and Katniss sings The Hanging Tree. These clips steer more rebellion. District 7, rebels ambush peacekeepers with mines, and District 5 demolishes a dam, cutting the capital's power supply and crippling their propaganda machine. Katniss's transformation into the Mockingjay isn't just about wearing a symbol, it's about becoming the symbol of hope and defiance against the capital's tyranny. Peta, still under the capital's control, suddenly warns of an impending attack on District 13. This leads President Coyne to order a hurried evacuation to underground shelters. Amidst the chaos, Prim nearly gets left behind, but everyone makes it to safety just in time. When they resurface, they see white roses scattered everywhere, a signature from President Snow himself taunting Katniss and hinting at Peta's peril. Coyne sends out special ops team, including Gale, on a mission to rescue Peta and other victors from the capital's clutches. The mission's a success, but when Katniss approaches Peta, he snaps and attacks her, almost strangling her to unconsciousness. It turns out the capital has hijacked Peta's mind, using a twisted combo of torture and tracker jacker venom to brainwash him into hating Katniss. This development is a gut punch, especially for viewers who've been rooting for Katniss and Peta's relationship. The hijacking of Peta's mind is a metaphor for the loss of identity and autonomy under oppressive power, and it's portrayed with a chilling realism that resonates beyond the screen. As Katniss grapples with this new twisted version of Peta, Coyne announces the successful rescue and gears up for a full-on assault on the capital. The scene where Katniss finds Peta restrained and wild-eyed in solitary confinement is particularly disturbing. The film doesn't shy away from themes like the personal costs of rebellion and the harsh realities of war, presenting them in a way that's both impactful and thought-provoking. Mockingjay Part 1 thus sets the stage for a climatic showdown, intertwining personal tragedy with broader themes of resistance and revolution. It's a film that goes beyond the typical dystopian narrative offering a deeper look into the psychological and emotional toll of fighting against a tyrannical regime. The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 Mockingjay Part 2 mix up with Katniss Everdeen recovering from Peta's attack. She's itching to get into the thick of things, asking President Alma Coyne to send her to District 2, the last non-rebel stronghold. Here, she and Gale lock horns over how to deal with capital loyalists. The rebels, with a plan hatched by Gale and Beatty, blow up the capital's weapons cache. Amidst this chaos, Katniss gets shot while trying to ease tensions during a refugee standoff. Meanwhile, President Snow is losing his cool. He's upset over his troops being quartered in District 2 in response 
responds in typical Snow fashion by poisoning his minister Antonius. He then hunkers down for a final bloody showdown, calling all peacekeepers back to the capital and setting up game maker design defenses. Katniss's world keeps spinning. Her visit to an unstable and resentful Peta leaves her feeling down. She boldly asks Coin to let her assassinate Snow, but Coin's like, nope, you're our symbol. Then comes Finnick and Annie's wedding, where Johanna tips Katniss off about a rebel flight to the capital. Katniss sneaks on board, much to Coin's annoyance. In the capital, Katniss and the crew, including Gale and Finnick, are part of the Star Squad, led by Boggs. Their job is to be the Rebellion's poster kid. Following the real fighters, they contend with the capital's booby-trapped streets with a holo dodging deadly pods. Finnick quips, welcome to the 76th Hunger Games, likening the pods to the arenas, and interestingly, Petus there too, still grappling with his hijacked mind. Boggs warns Katniss that Coin might be using Peta to get rid of her. The capital mission is treacherous. Boggs dies, leaving Katniss in charge with his final words, do what you came here to do. A pod triggers a black ooze flood, Peta has another hijack-induced episode, and the squad loses the leg twins to a peacekeeper attack. Snow and Cesar Flickerman declare Katniss and her squad dead, but Beatty hijacks the broadcast, allowing Coin to play the martyr card for Katniss. The stakes gets higher, and her ever-diminishing squad brave the capital. They take to the sewers, guided by Pollux, a former capital worker familiar with the underground. Peta, grappling with guilt over causing Mitchell's death, confesses to Katniss that his memories are slowly returning. Meanwhile, President Snow, upon realizing Katniss is still alive, sends reptilian mutts after her. In a sewer chase, several squad members meet their end. Katniss, in a desperate act, uses the holo to kill the mutts and put Finnick, who had been overwhelmed by mutts, out of his misery. Later, peacekeepers led to more casualties. The surviving members, including Katniss, Peta, and Gale, find refuge with Tigris, a former Hunger Games stylist. Here, Katniss confesses she lied about her mission to kill Snow, but her team admits they knew and followed her out of trust. Interestingly, Gale and Peta discuss their love for Katniss, essentially leaving the decision to her. As the rebels push into the capital, Snow invites civilians to his mansion for protection, a ruse to use them as human shields. The reason is the same as Cersei, allowing the common folk to surround her at the end of a Game of Thrones. Katniss and Gale disguise themselves as refugees to infiltrate Snow's stronghold. Katniss learns from Hamish that the rebels have taken the capital and captured Snow. Meanwhile, Snow suggests that President Coin orchestrated a bombing that killed several children, and Coin did it to turn the supporters against him, which essentially meant that Coin played both Snow and Katniss. This revelation, coupled with the realization that the bombs resembled the trap designed by Gale and Beatty, shatters Katniss. Confronting Gale, she's unable to forgive him for this possible role in Prim's death, marking a tragic end to their relationship. Katniss finds herself in a meeting with a newly self-appointed interim president, Coin, and other Hunger Games survivors. Here, Coin proposes one last Hunger Games featuring the children of the capital elite. It's an echo of history repeating itself. The vote splits with Beatty, Annie, and Peta opposing it. Katniss, seeing through Coin's ambitions and aligning them with Snow's earlier insinuations, votes yes, followed by Hamish. The scene sets up the final twist. At Snow's execution, Katniss faces him one last time. In a stunning turn of events, she shoots Coin instead of Snow. Also, Snow's end comes at the hands of an enraged mob, while Katniss, in a moment of despair, tries to end her life but is stopped by Peta. Despite her actions, Katniss is pardoned and deemed mentally unstable from her ordeal. A letter from the late Plutarch Heavensby, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, in one of his final roles suggests she returns to District 12. Back home, the film delves into the aftermath of trauma and the slow path to healing. Katniss and Peta, both scarred yet resilient, find solace and eventually love in each other's company. Years later, we see Katniss and Peta with two children, a symbol of hope and new beginnings. As Katniss comforts her child from a nightmare, she reflects on her own enduring scars. Mockingjay Part 2 wraps up the Hunger Games saga not with grandiose action, but with a focus on the human cost of revolution and the complexity of rebuilding after such widespread trauma. It's a fitting end to a series that has consistently challenged its audience to think about the consequences of violence and the nature of power and resistance. The film's conclusion, leaving Katniss in a state of somber reflection yet hopeful for the future, is a powerful commentary on the human spirit's ability to endure and find light in the darkest of times. I like to think that the story goes beyond simple good versus evil, delving into the complexities of rebellion, propaganda, and the cost of revolution. The film doesn't shy away from showing the sacrifices and moral dilemmas faced by those caught in the crossfire of political power plays.
The Hunger Games The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, November 17, 2023. The Hunger Games The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes takes us on a time warp to 64 years before Katniss Everdeen became the symbol of rebellion. This prequel, directed by Francis Lawrence, who also helmed the latter three Hunger Games films, delves into the backstory of a young Coriolanus Snow to be played by Tom Blythe. Before Snow becomes the infamous president of Pan Am, he's just a guy trying to restore his family's tarnished name in a post war capital. We also have Lucy Greybeard, played by Rachel Zegler. She's a tribute from District 12 with some real charm and the voice of a songbird. Snow, seeing an opportunity in Lucy Gray, decides to mentor her in The Hunger Games, aiming to twist fate in her favor. The movie, much like the novel, is based on promises to explore the intricate dynamics of predator and prey, raising the question, who are the real snakes and songbirds in this tale? Francis Lawrence teams up with franchise producer Nina Jacobson and her partner Brad Simpson, along with the original series author Suzanne Collins as the executive producer. The screenplay, penned by Michael Leslie and Michael Arndt, is expected to delve into the darker and more violent aspects of the Hunger Games universe, albeit within a PG-13 rating framework. Adding to the star-studded cast is Emmy Award winner Peter Dinklage playing Dean Casca Highbottom, one of the original creators of the Hunger Games. Dinklage, known for his dynamic roles ranging from the comedic to the deeply dramatic, will bring a fresh flavor to the movie. Personally, he's one of my absolute favorite actors. On the other side, side of the Spectrum Academy Award winner, Viola Davis steps into the role of Dr. Volumnia Gale, the head game maker of the 10th annual Hunger Games. Davis, with her vast and impressive career, is set to portray what appears to be one of the most formidable villains of the franchise. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is shaping up to be a fascinating exploration of the Hunger Games universe, providing a deeper look into the origins of one of its most complex characters, Coriolanus Snow. The film is poised to unravel the formative events that shaped the future president, offering fans a new perspective on the world of Pan Am. So that was all in this video. We've journeyed through the intricate and captivating timeline of the Hunger Games franchise from the early days of Pan Am and the rise of Coriolanus Snow and the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes to the iconic rebellion led by Katniss Everdeen. It's been a roller coaster of emotion, strategy, and survival, all set against the backdrop of a dystopian society. We witnessed the evolution of the Hunger Games themselves from a tool of oppression to a spark that ignited a revolution. If you liked the content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.